This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. So I hope you enjoyed your lunch. We're now moving on to the second session, which is titled The Second and the Next Decade in Energy Efficiency. Maybe it's not the second decade, but it's certainly <laughs> the next one. Our first speaker will be Henry Kelly from the Department of Energy, and he's going to speak about energy efficiency from a national perspective. However, before he gets up and talks, I'm going to uh, warn you that these, these talks will be 10 minutes, right, panel? 10 minutes. Absolutely. Furthermore, we're going to reserve the questions to the end, and so think carefully and, we'll, uh, if, and urge these people to uh, speak briefly so that we do have time for some questions. Henry. Thanks, uh, Alan. And I'm here talking about uh, energy efficiency in the next uh, couple of decades. And I guess there was some concern that uh, simply cloning Rosenfeld wasn't uh, really going to be adequate to this task. But I think that while the technology and a lot of the details are going to change, there's a certain essence of the art approach to things that lies at the, at the core, uh, one of which is never being afraid to ask a dumb question. And the beauty of what art brought from physics into the energy field was constantly asking, why are we doing it that way? Or what is the thermodynamic limit? Or why is this going so slowly? And as long as people keep on asking that question, it seems to me that's got to be the core of our, our, our future success. Now, one of the things we've done to try to build the future in Washington is, of course, uh, uh, try to bring into Washington as many people who studied at uh, the knee of Art Rosenfeld as possible. And you can see at all levels, starting from the very top in the Department of Energy, uh, we have people who understand and appreciate the way Art went about thinking about things. And in fact, we did start by trying to ask some of the big questions. You know, what are, you know, where is energy going? Why is it going there? What can we do about it? And of course, if you take an objective view of this, you are driven over and over again to the, the idea that Efficiency is overwhelmingly the most cost-effective, the most environmentally beneficial investment you can make in virtually every field. So uh, we have uh, tried to take this insight, of course, driven forward by Steve Chu, who uh, is uh, uh, passionate on, on this subject, and really had a, a transformative effect on already on a number of the key operations of the department. First of all, in R&D, one of the tr great problems we've had over the decades is to persuade people in basic research fields that energy efficiency is, involves intellectually stimulating deep uh, uh, challenges in chemistry, materials, science, uh, physics, information theory, and, and in other places. And uh, we've, of course, thanks to Steve uh, Chu, of course, we've brought into head ARPA-E, uh, another uh, Rosenfeld-trained person, Arun Mujumbar, who really gets it. He understands deeply how material science technology and other technologies are crucial to solving energy efficiency uh, problems. And we have, in fact, have worked uh, in ERE extremely closely with, uh, with him uh, and uh, working on a variety of issues. One of the, we, we had a joint workshop on building systems, which is turned into the, uh, the request for the building hub, as you can see, looking at how uh, the, the integrated uh, problems of operating whole buildings. We're also working hard on individual component technologies. Uh, we know about solid state lighting, but of course there's sensors and controls, advanced heating and cooling equipment, uh, and a variety of other specific technologies where there's an extremely close uh, and, and, and passionate working relationship between what we're doing and what ARPA-E and the Office of Science are doing. Uh, the same has been true, by the way, in uh, other areas of efficiency, vehicles uh, and, and in industry where there are uh, equally remarkable opportunities. Programmatically, uh, it has also changed our thinking. One of the features of, of having a president who is committed to thinking hard about climate change 
is you begin to realize that while, this, while the stock turns over slowly, uh, you, you can't get to your 2050 goals without doing something dramatically uh, with this, uh, the stock that's, gonna, that's in place today, whether that be uh, buildings or industrial processes. So you'll see a, an enormous increase in our investment in building retrofit, and the, uh, many of the technologies for new structures overlap, some don't, some of the analytical tools are the same, some aren't. Uh, we're trying to understand the difference but specifically, we're trying to put together very powerful uh, programs to try to change the incentives uh, that people have to invest in retrofits and understand more deeply uh, that we've always known that there appears to be the, uh, an enormous economic uh, resource in retrofitting buildings, but it hasn't been taken up. Uh, we have been fortunate to be able to work with uh, many parts of the uh, administration that actually care deeply about this. We're, we're extremely fortunate that Secretary Donovan of HUD uh, understands energy efficiency and has, uh, he, he and Secretary Chu have, have uh, formed a, 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 what has turned out to be an enormously productive partnership. One of the most important parts of which is that we're able to make use of the people who deeply understand the real estate financing mortgage uh, world in which the investors in, in, in uh, building efficiency live. And I think we have some very practical uh, programs put together uh, to uh, achieve that, uh, uh, to make uh, efficiency investments a routine part of real estate transactions. Well, of course, we have had this year uh, a something like $11 billion in, through the uh, Economic Recovery Fund. Our that, that, uh, that most of which has been uh, applied directly to uh, building retrofits because a lot of the, the state and local governments have been using their money for uh, uh, retrofits. The challenge here is you know, how do we use this money in a way that creates an enterprise and a set of programs that are sustainable and actually are able to maintain investment streams uh, after this money goes away. If we bungle that, we have, we have really lost one of the most imp important opportunities we have ever had. Of course, another part that has been important here is setting standards and the standards for both products and for uh, new buildings. Uh, we have uh, <coughs> been working aggressively uh, to uh, make up for an enormous backlog of, uh, of appliance standards. We think we've we put appliance uh, standards in place already that have saved $200 billion a year over the next 30 years, and we're, the next year we intend to do uh, to match that record. One of the reasons that this has happened is that uh, I was still trying to figure out how to put pencils in my desk when I got a call from Art Rosenfeld saying, what are you guys doing about TV standards? Why don't you guys get out of the way so we can do a TV standard? So uh, Art has, uh, this not so hidden hand of Art is always visible on, all, on, on each one of these activities. Uh, building codes of the work that California has done in Title 24 has inspired um, uh, interest in trying to get national programs. Uh, we're working very hard on that. Another feature, though, that has driven all of this is we've discovered that we have been talking to ourselves as a community of, of, of believers in efficiency. There's a whole world of finance uh, and, uh, that just flat doesn't believe us. And that was one of the interesting things about talking to the hardcore finance people in HUD and other places. They say, you're claiming these savings exist. Prove it. You know, don't wave your hands. I don't want to see computer models. You know, we, we react to data. Well, of course, Art, uh, years ago, had a program in place to collect exactly this kind of data called BICA, and it was an equivalent one for uh, commercial buildings. This is something that we are really uh, passionate about restoring because we need to move smartly towards data-based, uh, empirically-based uh, programs that are continuously improved uh, and gather data that uh, helps us both uh, drive research, improve the programs, and really make more effective use of the, of, of the, the programs we put in place. So in, in, in brief, the uh, ability of art to sit there to, to force us to go back to ask the tough questions about why why are we really so far from the thermodynamic limit? And we are a long way from the, the theoretical potential of, of efficiency in buildings and in elsewhere. Uh, forces you once again to say, uh, we need to redouble our efforts to, to achieve this opportunity because without grabbing this opportunity of, of the represented by efficiency, we will never be able to meet uh, the president's ambitious goals of, uh, of greenhouse gas reductions and. Uh, and uh, uh, reductions in petroleum uh, consumption. So 
we, we, uh, the good news is that a lot of people who have trained under art are in a, in a position to try to help solve this problem, and I'm, I'm, ac I'm actually optimistic uh, about what we'll be able to do in the next few years. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Our next speaker is Ann Smith from Semper Utilities. I feel so honored to uh, be invited to speak here today, and um, I'm also uh, feeling uh, very privileged to be able to join all of you in paying tribute to a great man, uh, Art Rosenfeld. I think there's no doubt that Art is the icon of energy efficiency. Uh, not only is he a, a brilliant scientist, uh, he's also a visionary policymaker and a master of collaboration. I think that um, no single person has uh, made greater contribution to putting California first in energy efficiency uh, than Art Rosenfeld. He is a hero, he's our hero, and uh, I think all of Californians really are greatly indebted to uh, Art for all the work that he's done in his life. So thank you and uh, we wish you well. Now when I was asked to uh, share my thoughts about the next decade in energy efficiency, I, ha I just had to first think back and ponder uh, about the last decades of uh, energy efficiency in California. And as I did that, I realized that I actually first encountered energy efficiency and began to hear about this legendary Art Rosenfeld about 30 years ago. Now, back then I was a very young engineer at uh, Southern California Gas Company, and my job was to build a uh, demand forecasting model. And I was calculating you know, all the energy savings attributable to these conservation and efficiency measures. Uh, I was trying to figure out how to capture the then new impact of Title 2024 and doing a lot of research, uh, market research, to figure out how we can motivate customers to uh, adopt conservation and efficiency. So it brought back some fond memories. And I also remember in Southern California Gas Company's 1980 general rate case, the CPUC had chastised us for being rather lukewarm uh, in supporting conservation and efficiency. So they challenged us to do better, and they put in place a $5 million reward penalty incentive. So even a decade before the, kind of the, the official establishment of an incentive mechanism, for energy efficiency, the policymakers actually piloted this concept with SoCal Gas, and, and I was there. And as I thought about it, I, I felt very historic, <laughs> or, or maybe just old, I think. But I thought about how far we've come since 30 years ago, and it truly has been very impressive. I think everyone has seen the, the, the famous Rosenfeld uh, effect chart where we've shown that the per capita electricity uh, trend in California has held flat, where the rest of the country has grown by 50%. And I also want to remind folks that on the natural gas side, which we sometimes forget, in Southern California, if you look at the uh, per household usage of natural gas over the last 30 years, it has actually decreased by over 40%. And I think that's truly amazing. And it's no wonder that California has earned the reputation of being world class, the best in class in energy efficiency. So then I ponder, well, what actually made us great over the last uh, triple decades? And I think that uh, a few things came to mind. First, I think the California policymakers have always had visionary um, and very committed leadership in this area. I think secondly, California has very wisely adopted kind of a three-prong approach of advanced technology, tough standards, and steadfast uh, programs that were uh, supported by the utilities. And finally, I think we have always had the collaboration of the key stakeholders, the PUC, the Energy Commission, the legislature, the utility service providers, and literally hundreds of stakeholders. So from my standpoint as an energy utility person, we have uh, had to undergo quite a transformational mind shift, if you will, over the last three decades. Uh, energy efficiency actually started as a mandate. It was a regulatory thing that we had to do. Now, it was a very tough start because not too long before that, we were still promoting incremental throughput because we made more money by selling more of our product. 
So suddenly uh, our profits were decoupled from sales and we were told to unsell our product, if you will. So that was a major, major mind shift for us. And then as we started to implement these programs, we actually grew to like them because we discovered that it was actually a good thing. Uh, it was a good goodwill uh, type of uh, activity with our customers. They liked the fact that we were able to help them save money. And then as we start to see the tangible results and the real benefits of energy efficiency, then we began to embrace it truly as an integrated part of our resource. It is by far the cheapest and the cleanest resource that, that we could have in our portfolio. And then I think in 2006, um, when AB32 was adopted, the, the reason uh, for energy efficiency became crystal clear to all of us. I think the enormous um, uh, undertaking to reduce the GHG emission has really compelled us to look at energy efficiency in a brand new light, to look from every new angle, to, to try to extract the very last ounce of cost-effective energy efficiency. So I think looking at where we are today and where we need to go, I then wonder, you know, what would it take to uh, keep us great? What would it take to, to, to help us maintain that, that winning edge and be able to maintain this much envied uh, position of being the world leader? I think that there's no doubt that we're facing circumstances that uh, challenge California's position in leadership. Um, first of all, I think we all know about the economy. It is really not all that great. Uh, businesses are daily being courted by uh, states uh, other than California that promise to have a more uh, affordable uh, business climate, a more friendly business kind of climate. We also see the growth of population in California being uh, faster than other regions. And we also seem to continue to experience this kind of the, the fierce and endless debate about just what the uh, California priorities should be. So I kind of wonder whether we are sort of at a point, cause sort of a defining moment in the history of energy efficiency in California where over the next decade, we're either going to rise above all the fray and truly make energy efficiency kind of a, um, a standard course of business, or are we going to lose pace? And as other states like Massachusetts or other countries surpass us. In uh, 2006, California uh, adopted some of the largest statewide energy efficiency campaign in U.S. history. Uh, there were $2 billion committed over three years to, to implement cost-effective energy efficiency measures. And the current cycle that we're in now actually is an even more uh, aggressive and ambitious. Uh, we will be investing over $3 billion over three years uh, to go after energy efficiency. So while we're seeing some unprecedented gains in efficiency, I think that we're also facing some unprecedented need uh, to do more. We have to go faster and we have to go farther. A couple of years ago, uh, Commissioner Grunick convened uh, hundreds of stakeholders uh, to come together and develop the California's long-term energy efficiency strategic plan. And there were, uh, among lots of other initiatives, there were some uh, what we uh, ended up calling the big bull strategies that I want to highlight for you. Strategy number one says that all new residential construction in California will be zero net energy by 2020. Number two, similar kinds of a goal for commercial new construction by 2030, zero net energy. Strategy number three says that we're going to transform the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning industry. And, and this is really kind of intended to go after the air conditioning, uh, which drives the very expensive need for peak capacity in California. And then strategy number four says that by 2020, all of the eligible and willing low-income households in California will have received all the cost-effective energy efficiency measures for their homes. So I think these are pretty bold and they're pretty big. And the question is, will we get there? And how will we get there? I think the future gains in energy efficiency will depend on several things. And, and they're things that I've been talking about today. I think it will depend on breakthroughs and acceleration of cost-effective technologies. 
it will depend on persistent and consistent public policy, a supportive market framework, uh, creative engagement of the end users, and finally, the unprecedented collaboration between all the stakeholders. In other words, if we're going to achieve these big, bold strategies, then we're going to have to innovate like we've never innovated, and we're going to have to collaborate like we've never collaborated before. Uh, and it's been said so many times, it's like we need lots of Art Rosenfeld going forward. I think on the technology front, uh, there are in fact some very, very promising technologies uh, in the lighting area, building designs, um, construction, control. Uh, I think also a big potential will be uh, brought about by the uh, advent of the smart meters, which will, I think, stimulate a lot of the uh, control technologies. I think that we have to prioritize and we have to make sure that these development efforts are funded. We need to speed them to the market. We need to engage all the stakeholders in this process, the decision makers, business, entrepreneurs, service providers, so that we can define the mutually beneficial roles that we each can have in working together toward the same goal. We then need to put energy efficiency back as our number one priority, even ahead of the renewables, in order to meet our energy and environmental goals. So maybe we need to sort of rebrand energy efficiency, if you will, so that it could be just as sexy as solar. We need to treat energy efficiency not just as a cost, but as an asset, uh, not different than many of the assets that we use today to serve uh, our customers' energy needs. And, and as these technologies reach the market, we have to apply the best social and behavioral science to help drive the consumer adoption. I was just at a conference yesterday, uh, Metering America, where the theme was uh, where technology meets the customers. And I have put forth this notion that it doesn't matter how sophisticated the smart meter technology is. It doesn't matter how immense the potential uh, benefits are. If the consumers don't embrace it, in the end, it's going to be a waste of money. And so finally, I think that we have to really focus on execution and really getting it right. I think to all of us, the objective is clear, the constraints are real, and we have to just find a, a good way to get it done. Not a lot of churn, not a lot of swirls, uh, and minimizing the fragmentation uh, that may be still in place today so that we can get there. So as I look back and as I look forward, I see the vision le visionary leaders such as Art Rosenfeld, Commissioner Grunick, and many others in this room have built a legacy in California of being the world class in energy efficiency. But I also see that times are tough and there are lots of things that are competing for um, our time, our energy, and our money. So it's going to be really tough when you're the best of the best to know that you've got to do even better. And what came to my mind was, was it'd be like telling the, uh, the U.S. Olympic gold medalist, Sean White, the snowboarder. It's like telling him that, you know, you, you were spectacular, but you've got to come up with something even better than the double McTwist 1260. So <laughs> it's, it's really going to be tough. But I think that uh, I think we can do it. And I think we must do it. I, I think the, 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 the success that we've had in the past should give us confidence that we could move forward. And just knowing that when we get there, we're going to have a thriving green economy, we're going to have a more sustainable future, that will motivate us to keep forward. And I would like to close with actually a quote from our honoree. Uh, our has mastered the technical ins and outs of our business, and he, but he knows that energy efficiency still has a human side. And this is one of his uh, time-tested strategy for success that I'd like to leave with you. He tells us, and I quote, the price of liberty is eternal vigilance, but the price of energy efficiency is eternal nagging. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, Art, thank you for what you brought us, and thank you for what you've taught us. Thank you, Anne. Uh, our next speaker is Ashok Godgill from the Lawrence Berkeley National La Laboratory. And uh, he's going to speak about energy efficiency from the developing world perspective. And I want to assure the audience that uh, there 
you're not supposed to read anything special into the fact that we started in the national energy policy or the next decade, then California, and now we're moving to the developing world. That's not meant to indicate where California may be leading. <laughs> but at the same time, it may be a source of new ideas. So with that, I'd like to introduce Ashok. Thanks very much, Alan. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, and it's a tremendous honor for me to stand and felicitate Art. Uh, I think I'm one of the luckiest people in the world to have been his graduate students. Uh, and uh, as all of us know who have worked with him even a little bit, uh, it leaves a very deep mark uh, on the way you think to have worked with him on anything. And he just won't let you give up. That's, that's what it's meant by eternal nagging. <laughs> so I want to start off by saying why there are two sides to this question about developing countries. Why should we care and why should they care? Right? So you, you take a step back and start by looking at what, what do the developing countries care about? And the UN gathered a, a number of experts to come together to, from the developing world to decide to create an index, a quantitative metric of what do the developing world, world cares about. And it came up with this single metric, single number called HDI, or Human Development Index, uh, that is a quantitative measure put together by uh, pulling various aspects of particularly three dimensions, one of which is uh, economic prosperity and well-being, uh, economic well-being, the, the second one being life expectancy, public health, and health care quality, and a third being literacy and education. So all these three dimensions are put together into a single number that is normalized. It goes from the lowest of numbers being zero, maximum being one, and the United Nations, UNDP, United Nations Development Program, each year publishes HDI for each developing country and puts it up on the web. And that's based on statistics that everybody considers to be as good as it could be. Okay? So what do the developing countries care about? Most developing country populations care about having a high HDI. And this is what HDI looks like if you look at it uh, as a function of electricity consumption per capita in terms of kilowatt hours per person per year. At the very high end, on the top right-hand side, is Norway, which has so much electricity that they use electric heating, that they have, they have hydro, they, you know, they just they make aluminum, they don't know how to use it, right? So there is, there is Norway, that's, that's the green dot on the, on the top right. But then you begin to see Canada and Kuwait and United States and Australia are the next four green dots near that orange line, which HDI values being about 9.2. And then uh, there's a whole cluster of European countries with Japan in there. Uh, there's Japan, France, Netherlands, Italy, United Kingdom, and that's around about you know, 7,500 kilowatt hours per person per year. That's the average electricity consumption still in California, of course, for after all these years. Uh, and then you have this sudden steep drop as the, as the curve, the scatter drops with lower and lower HDI and lower and lower kilowatt hours, okay? So what the curve tells us, at least empirically, as all these countries try to climb up in HDI, they're going to climb up in their electricity consumption. And they, if they want to get past 0 0.9, it's very likely that they are going to go past about 4,000 or 5,000, which means, uh, electricity consumption and emissions are going to go up very substantially because those green dots, the ones I've shown there, are not sized according to the size of the populations, right? Uh, this is what it looks like if you were to look at uh, uh, the CO2 emissions of selected countries. There are per capita CO2 emissions. High up there is United States, about 22, and the dashed line shows where we want to go, about five, that's the world average. And the two giants sitting in the, in the corner here, near the left bottom, is India and China. And India and China, of course, want to jump up 
and get there. And the question is, will you uh, have them follow the red trajectory or the, or the blue trajectory? And uh, of course, if they follow our trajectory, the, the trajectory of the industrial countries, they are going to follow the red trajectory. And that means we are all going to be toast along with them. <laughs> so, so that is why we should be interested in what they do. <laughs> and they should be interested as well, because this is the only trajectory that we know so far. We haven't had anybody, any country, get to five uh, per capita in terms of CO2 emissions uh, and be prosperous. We haven't, we just, it's entirely new territory. So their question from the developing country side, of course, is that atmosphere is a global commons. There is very little headroom left for emitting CO2. CO2 has a 100-year life. You industrial countries have taken up most of the headspace there. So we didn't put, the, put up that GAG. What about us? How about making room for us? And there's no room for them. That's, that's a sad story, right? So two illustrative answers, both of which have a lot to do with art. First is UV waterworks. I'll just show you a couple of slides. It is there today, gone to scale, only because art pushed me to keep on keep on, essentially, not give up, even though there's tremendous uh, difficulty in going to scale outside the lab. And the Berkeley Darfur stove, we, we essentially followed Art's approach here. Now we have thousands of these stoves in Darfur and more are on the way. So here is how people traditionally collect water. Uh, there are about two billion people uh, with access to poor quality water in the world, out of which about 1.2 billion are Rural people, they, they, they fetch water on their shoulders like this many times a day. Uh, each UV waterworks is about a device about the size of a microwave oven. It offsets about 2,000 tons of CO2 equivalent annually. Uh, even when it replaces renewable biomass-fired cookstoves. And this is what collecting water looks like now in the same village where that woman was collecting water on her shoulders. Uh, and the price is 0 0.2 cents. Uh, per liter, much cheaper than a cup of tea. Uh, another example is uh, cook stoves, efficient, fuel efficient stoves. Two billion people, the bottom most two billion people cook on solid fuels, mostly with stoves of low efficiency. Here is a uh, uh, sub-Saharan African example of a woman cooking on a three-stone fire, very low efficiency. Here is an example of a Berkeley Darfur stove. It costs $30, saves about $250 worth of fuel every year, lasts for five years, and offsets, and this is excluding the, the carbon credits part, and, and offsets about two tons of CO2 equivalent per year for Darfur, because Darfur, uh, essentially, it is a, is a non-renewable biomass territory. People are chopping down what little biomass there exists in Darfur. So, of course, there is an, an additional effect of uh, avoiding soot in the atmosphere. Soot has very low residence time. Unlike CO2, which lasts for 100 years, soot lasts for four weeks. So if you go to low soot emission efficient stoves for these people, there's a dramatic reduction predicted in the soot concentration. And soot has a very strong radiative forcing next uh, only to CO2. Lastly, just a couple of slides. This slide shows, of course, the world population density. Yeah? And you can see very high population density in areas which are so deep red, they're almost purple. Uh, notice the, the red spots also in the populous parts of Africa. Uh, and of course, China and Asia stand out. The next slide is Earth from space. Okay? If you go back and forth, you see that there is a big dissonance between the two slides. Earth from space is where the light is leaking out, seen by satellite. That's a composite photograph. And this is a slide where the people are located. Notice that Africa is all dark, and they are going to turn on the lights. Real incomes are rising. Sooner or later, they will turn on the lights. Notice again uh, uh, how big chunks of uh, Asia and India are dark. Okay? When they get as bright as the United States Eastern Seaboard, we hope they turn on efficient lights, not incandescence. <laughs> that leads us directly into the next talk, so thank you very much. Thank you, Ashok.
Our next speaker is Evan Mills, also from Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, and he will focus on not cook stoves and uh, not uh, maintaining clean water, but illuminating the developing world, and perhaps illu illuminating the developed world. Alan always has a twist for us. Um, thanks, Ashok. That that's, is a perfect lead-in here. Um, I'm. Uh, oops. <laughs> what happened to my title slide? Somebody took my title slide away. Okay. Um, you can laugh again in a minute. I'll just take you right there. Uh, so. <laughs> I first walked into uh, into arts class of physics of efficient energy use. It was about 30 years ago. I was five, and uh, so I, I was I was auditing. But uh, we uh, actually Carl Bloomstein was in in the room with us for that that semester and and others here, and uh, I immediately was infected, of course. And he said, "Why don't you come up the hill?" And I said, "What's the hill?" And he said, "Get in my VW Rabbit or whatever it was." And up we went, and I essentially never never left. Uh, and we all know art as uh, certainly no chicken, right? We've established that today, but uh, but a, a real incubator of energy efficiency, and uh, uh, I was, you know, fortunate to be one of the graduate students that he took under his wing, along with almost everybody else in this room. So it was crowded there, uh, but the CFL, right, was his. Uh, you know, iconic prop that he always uh, carried around with him, and we, you know, we those who know him think about him uh, waving that CFL, and and I certainly saw that many times. And when I was uh, worked as his deputy at LBL. Uh, for years before he went to Washington, uh, like Henry, I would, whenever I had a new idea, I would go to art and say, you know, am I crazy or not? And one of those days, it was one of those evening uh, phone calls uh, that uh, many of you know, and it was early, it was only 10 p.m., and we were, we were talking through, and I said, well, what about LED lighting for the developing world? And, uh, you know, couldn't we have a technological leapfrogging opportunity here, which is what Ashok was showing, right? Can we go over the blue curve with lighting instead of that orange-red curve? And uh, he was immediately supportive and encouraging. And um, I'd already been working in lighting, and, and uh, a bit later I was in, uh, in India for a meeting on electric lighting, and we were talking in Delhi about CFLs and dimming ballasts and so on, and I took vacation time after, found myself in Varanasi one night on the street and photographed this man who was selling beads and baubles with a kerosene lantern, and it just really, I'd been thinking about fuel-based lighting before that, but it really hit me uh, how, you know, how many are there like him, and how much energy and how much carbon and how much money is this? And the Lumina project was born really at that time, and the work that uh, we've done since then, and that's been supported by art. Uh, many of you know, uh, he generously took his almost $400,000 gift from the Fermi Award and donated that to the Blum Center for Developing Economies at UC Berkeley, and that money has gone out to support work like Ashok described and has gone out also to support this work. Um, some numbers kind of picking up on the picture, uh, the dimensions of the problem was the first thing we did. How big is this? And the, the bar chart is a uh, picture from an article we did in Science in 2005, it's quite a few years later. Uh, we know it's a third of the population that has no electricity, the dark areas. Uh, but what no one did know up to that point is that it's roughly um, uh, uh, a, f a fifth or a sixth of all the energy for lighting in the world, and that was $40 billion. Uh, that's our estimate from that article. Uh, in terms of carbon, it's like 30 million cars, or if you would sell that on the European exchange, it's something like $4 billion a year of carbon revenue, if you could possibly monetize and reduce those emissions. The lower chart is from uh, the uh, International Energy Agency. This just shows the, the number of unelectrified people in the open circles today and the number in 2030, 20 years from now. And you see basically we're going sideways and in sub-Saharan Africa, we're even looking at growth in the unelectrified uh, by 100 million more people than today. So this is a big problem. It's here. It's not going away anytime soon. Um, those are, are a lot of numbers. You know, there's a very human face to this. The, the kid on the left, he's going home with a, a few tablespoons of kerosene in an empty Coke bottle to provide an hour or two of light that night. He can't afford to buy one liter of kerosene at the gas station for a dollar. And this is very common. The woman and her child in the middle, they were selling these little dried fish, you know, by a, a wick lamp. Basically, it's a shoelace inside of a repurposed food container. You can see some out in the front there. And the businessman balancing his books at the end of the evening by a candle. The person in the lower right is lighting with uh, pitch pine. It's called jara, very common in the Himalayas. This is fuel wood being used for illumination purposes, not an uncommon practice. Um, 
this is very important in the non-household sector. We think of this as a household issue. These are micro enterprises, right? Millions, tens of millions of these in the developing world. You're looking at seven businesses here on the ground. Each light is, a, is an entrepreneur selling fruit in this case. And they're burning, you know, $75 a year of kerosene uh, and, you know, a good fraction of a ton of kerosene every year, a ton of CO2 coming out. Look at the juxtaposition of the electric lighting right there across the street. Uh, they're, they're so close, but nowhere near being electrified themselves. Um, so we start looking at these technologies. Uh, these are these wick lamps I was telling you about, all kinds of shapes and sizes, different fuel use rates. The fellow here, this is in Kibera, the large slum, slum in Nairobi. This is a little factory making these lanterns, uh, very common. These sell for 20 cents each, but burn something like $50 a year of kerosene, depending you know, on your assumptions, just not unlike the electric incandescent light bulb in, in the ratio of the numbers. This is even more severe, though. So we spend a lot of time understanding the technology. And, and of course, in comes LED. And could this really work here? Could it make a difference? Would it be affordable? All these questions come up. On the top is just a side-by-side -side picture of the two light sources. You can see the splash of light in the front. You know, there's a lot more illumination coming out. And the pictures on the bottom I took in Tanzania in one of these night markets. This person was selling plastic sandals, you know, and you don't you can see the dramatic effect in not only the illuminance level, but also the color rendering and what a boon this is to an entrepreneur. And so this whole notion of productive use comes in. It's not just saving money, but also increasing business and a uh, hundredfold increases in, in efficiency and a hundredfold increases in the energy services that are offered. So we get out in the street and we've been focus grouping with hundreds of people now with different LED lighting products because there's a whole proliferation of these products coming to the market. Uh, but uh, like was said earlier, you have to really look at the consumer. It's not just an issue for uh, smart meters. It's also for technologies like this and what really works for these people because they don't like a lot of these products and they don't really meet the needs. So we've done a tremendous amount of listening and showing and then giving that feedback to manufacturers. Then we come back to... Um, to the issue of product quality. And so we s established a laboratory here. We is my colleague Arne Jacobson at the uh, Humboldt State University. We've had a vibrant collaboration for some years now. He's brought uh, more than a dozen students into the mix. We've had students also from Stanford and Berkeley, which is uh, remarkable. We've not on the same team, of course. but. Um, <laughs> So how do these things uh, perform? And we've done a lot of lab testing. Um, these, it's a simple technology, but really uh, there's a lot of complexity that's veiled. Uh, you have the LED itself, and that's what most of us think about. The LED has its own problems. We've seen almost tenfold variance in the efficiency of the LEDs in these products. Um, but also there's, there's storage, there's battery, there's circuitry. Uh, we've seen terrible... Um, truth in advertising claims about how long, many times a battery can be recharged and how quickly it discharges. There are PV panels, crank lights, capacitors, uh, grid charging. Uh, how efficient are those? We've looked at the PV panels, lots of efficiency problems in the products chosen. I just measured, uh, I think Chris Caldwell is here somewhere, uh, just measured the AC power adapter because a lot of people are charging in cell phone micro enterprises. And uh, we're looking at 3% uh, efficiency in the worst product that we measured. And that's uh, almost negates the whole carbon benefit. This is the sixfold, tenfold variation in lumens per watt for the LEDs we've looked at. Uh, we talked to the early adopters, back to the field, lab field, lab field. These are night watchmen, the early adopters of LED flashlights. Uh, there are arguably more people in the developing world using LEDs today than here. It's, the, the leapfrogging is already happening, but massive market spoiling problem because these things, uh, they break, they don't last as long as they're supposed to. Uh, so what do we do? We, we take our lab work and we find good products that really test out well and we bring them into the market and we've been running market tests to see um, whether people, what the price point is because we don't really want to play with subsidies. We want to see can these products survive on their own merits in the market. And we've sold about 50 systems so far in different tests and um, We've offered at the end of these tests, which run about six months, people can give us their lights back for 100% refund, and no one accepts that. So that's a pretty good uh, existence proof that this is working. Also talking to night vendors, and here they're telling us these, these co-benefits. Uh, it's safer, our, our customers have increased, their revenues increased. And this guy, MJ, actually um, was earning enough money, he sold his shop and went back to school. So we, we lost a data point and we gained a, uh, we gained a student. <laughs> Um, just a couple more pictures. Um, so the environment. So there's, as we all know, there are two environmental dimensions of 
the whole energy and energy efficiency equation. There's indoor and outdoor. So indoor, uh, we all know anecdotally that there are there's soot and there are emissions, but this has not been measured well at all. And until recently, we're, we're actually the first study to measure the so-called PM 2.5 particle sides from kerosene lanterns. These are the, the particles that really penetrate deeply into the lungs and are the big health concern. And these are just now um, in, in review for publication. Um, you're one of the first audiences to see these, uh, 10 times the World Health Organization standard for PM 2.5, real issue. Um, kind of finishing up with carbon, uh, we're looking at um, a program now that we're proposing to the UN CDM to bring all these quality considerations into the evaluation of the LED products. And when you do that, this is a straw man set of six case studies. You could have anywhere from zero carbon value to um, very significant carbon value. So we're going to try to use the carbon markets as a driver for improved quality. This is a little micrologger that we've invented under Arts Product Project. It's smaller than a quarter. It goes inside the LED lamp, and it measures on time. And so we can see the blue curves are the on time for these lights, and we can actually know in this sense how much carbon or a part of how much carbon is being saved and when people use the lights. Uh, so there's a high-tech kind of side of this. And lastly, uh, the scale-up, which is so important. Uh, we've been very successful here. Uh, first, a few years ago, Lighting Africa was formed, which is a project of the uh, World Bank and IFC. Uh, they sent us to Africa to help write a GEF proposal, and uh, that's up at $12 million now, doing all these kind of things. And uh, just in December, Secretary Chu in Copenhagen announced the uh, solar LED deployment program, and this will put $50 million into this exact problem uh, beyond Africa as well uh, to really help make these markets. And one of the last activities, and the one I want to close with, is our, one of Art's key interests has been to create an industry association. We've seen the success with NFRC and uh, Coal Roof Rating Council, and um, my gift to Art today is that this industry association has been born and uh, will be convening. We have a meeting of 500 stakeholders in, in Nairobi in a, about six weeks, and one of the big topics there will be what to do with this association. So uh, we've got a website and uh, email address if you want to know more, uh, the Lumina Project. Thank you very much. Thank you, Evan. Uh, we have time for about two questions. If the microphone is out there, I, I can't see anybody uh, right now, but is the microphone available for a question? And before you forget, would you like to try to answer the question about where have the profits from conservation gone? The, um, you know, it's, it's very interesting. When we brief our new board of directors and we explain how we make money, uh, inevitably they're, they're sort of like shocked uh, that we're so different from the consumer model. The reality is that we have not been harmed at all. And in fact, uh, there have been incentive mechanisms that have been put in place to try to get us closer to uh, be indifferent, if you will between investing in energy efficiency and investing in iron in the ground is typically what we call it. I, I think we haven't perfected it yet. I think the concept is very sound, and I think we have to you know, just continue to improve on the way we implement that concept. Uh, it, it is a foreign concept, but I, I do think that the shareholders, at least our shareholders, get it. And they actually um, appreciate the fact that we're investing in um, efficiency. But, but, but again, I think if it really is going to become part of sort of business as is, we probably have a little more ways to go to make uh, energy efficiency equivalent to our other investments. And I'm not sure about the first question. I, I think uh, we're going to pass on that okay. first question simply because uh, uh, we've, we've we talked too long, believe it or not, and uh, I, I want to leave time for the next panel. So with that, thank you very much you. for your thoughts.